So I've titled this talk, uh, Remembering Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirited Persons, in reference to what fundamentally our project is about. And this was one of those points when immediately you do remember that this is a pretty difficult topic to talk about. Um, but part of the work that we do through Walking with Our Sisters is really about helping to shift that narrative as well. And we're really focused on honoring the memories and focusing on celebrating their lives as opposed to focusing just on how they left us. But nonetheless, it can be a very painful thing. Um, so I really wanted to thank Nina for making sure to provide that information right at the top. We find that in our work, it's really, really important to always be thinking about how we're caring for the people who are working with us and making sure that you have access to resources and people to talk to it is a critical point for us as well. So my introduction begins with some words in my indigenous language, Nihiawewen, which is known as Cree. So, Kanze, Imakmo, Magak, Ebani, Tokemte, Miyokisagao, Anoch, Eski, Kapimotata, Nsika, Aslan, Ms. Tadaiga Nochenia, Nagawi Margaret Capo, Sikasu, Ewa, Nantawi Fun, Carl Cardinal, Sikasu. This introduction in the Cree language is something that is a practice that I have been trying to cultivate. I am Cree, but this is not a language that I'm fluent in. And like many, many indigenous people, our languages have been disappearing. And so part of our responsibility, I feel anyways, my own sense of responsibility, is to do everything that I can to try and help maintain this language. So even though I lack fluency, and I probably didn't pronounce everything correctly, and maybe my grammar wasn't quite right, I always make it a point to start out introducing myself in the Cree language. One of the other things that I wanted to point to in making this introduction the way that I did, which I'll translate really um, loosely here, it's basically, hello, how are you? My relatives and my friends. It's a beautiful day today. My name is Eski Kumutatat, which is a Cree name, and I usually don't translate it because it wasn't given to me in English. So I usually just speak it in Cree. Um, I say that I'm from the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation and that my parents are named Margaret Capo and Cap Cardinal. <coughs> and I'm going to ask here for forgiveness because I have been battling a bit of a cold that doesn't want to let go, so I might be coughing a little bit um, and stopping frequently to drink water, so please don't mind me. My parents are both Cree and they're from the same territory. And when we make our introductions as Cree people, it's very important to acknowledge or to state our names, but also to give the place that we're from. And when we say where we're from, it's not just the physical location, the territory, the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, which is the First Nations or what would be known here as the Native American um, community. It's also who we're from. So my people are and I first identify them through my parents, and more properly would also name my grandparents and as far back as I can, so that you would know the people that I'm coming from. And just in relation to that, when I speak of the physical location, I put a map so you can have an idea of where I'm literally coming from. The circle up there is Edmonton. That's where I live right now, um, and the star up to the northwest of it, this is where the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation is. So in relation to where we are right now here in Florida, I've tried to show, so you can have a sense of, of where I'm actually physically locating myself, both where I'm coming from and where I am today. The locating part of an introduction is also an important practice when we're sharing in information such as what I'm here to share with you today, because I really feel it's important that you have a sense of where I'm coming from. Even at an interesting level, even if this doesn't really make 
any connection for you, never having been to that part of the world, you have no sense of what it's like. But when I talk about myself as a Cree person, as a Cree woman, as an indigenous person, this means that I'm seeing the world from a very particular place and understanding things in a very particular way. And it's really important for us to always be thinking about that, especially when we talk about very serious issues, because it does come into how we speak about it, how we think about it. And so by locating myself, it gives for you the, hopefully, a sense of understanding of where I'm coming from. But I'd also like to encourage you to think about where you're coming from and where you're currently located and what this means. <clears throat> The other part of the locating that I'm doing is thinking about this distance that I've traveled, which when you fly across the continent, it's so easy to have no sense of how far you've come. But when you look at it on a map, it's quite a distance. But I can tell you that I came from weather that was snowy and cold to sunshine and for me a very, very warm temperature. And there is no way for any second that I could doubt that I was in a very, very different land. I'm very aware of myself as a guest in this territory, as a visitor. And so in the introduction that I made, it is usually the way that we introduce ourselves on a personal level. But when we go into some other territory, we're saying where we're from also as a bit of diplomacy. Because when we're a guest in somebody else's territory, we need to acknowledge that. And these are practices that are, I think, very important. And so I incorporate them into the presentations that I do. But what I was also thinking about in preparation to come here was in showing up here, in entering into this territory, whose territory I am in. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't identify myself as a Canadian. I come from a land that is now known as Canada. I know that it's a different context than the United States. But even though I think of the United States while I'm here, I am also thinking about the indigenous people of this land and who they are. And one of the things that struck me very powerfully was, A, I'm coming in without really knowing, so it's my responsibility to try and find out as much as I can. When I looked to do some research, there were a couple of things that struck me. Number one, the history is represented as in this area in most of Florida, that the indigenous people who lived here prior to contact, prior to 1492, have largely disappeared from the area. So I don't even know the names of the peoples who were originally here. I don't know what the stories are. And I don't know if it's entirely true that they have largely disappeared. What I do know is the only thing that people are the Seminole, and I'm probably not going to pronounce this right, the Mikusaki. Thank you. <laughs> this was really amazing to me when I think about it because I come from a place where our presence as Indigenous people is so much more visible. Even though we are also in the midst of a Canadian society, invisibilized. But I can be in the territory that I come from, I can be in the territory that I live in, and I can speak about the peoples there. So when I come into a different land and I realize that it's not quite the same history, it's not the, the same context, not only does it make me sad, but it also makes me realize that, that there is a particular responsibility, again, and I keep using this, this word because it's a key one for me, a particular responsibility for us when we're in the territories that we're in, whether they're our own or we're guests, to learn about the people of that territory. So I put together this introduction with those ideas in mind, and I really wanted to highlight them so it wasn't just a simple statement that I made in Cree. It also contains all of these ideas and practices inside of it. And so when I talk about walking with our sisters, one of the things that I think will become apparent by the time I get through the presentation is very similar, but there are so many things that are going on. We're not going to cover there's so many things that I just couldn't fit into the time, time frame. So there's a lot of things that we'll be omitting. But one of the things that I wanted to try and do is give you an overview and hopefully leave you with some things to think about and things to take upon yourself 
to know. I'm not assuming that you know nothing about this territory, but if you don't really know who the peoples are, if you don't really know what that history is, I strongly encourage you to look into it. So, walking with our sisters. When Walking With Our Sisters was first conceived of, and as it was moving forward to, to come into fruition, one of the ways that we talked about it is as a commemorative art installation. So there's very much an art-based foundation here. But some things have changed, which I'll get into a little bit further on. But this poster was the very one of the very first um, things that were put together to help promote this. And what you'll see here is kind of really gives you a sense of what's happening in Walking With Our Sisters. There is, along the pathway here, I don't know how well you can see from back there, but there's these images here which are vamps, which I will talk a little bit more about. And then there's somebody walking alongside of them barefoot. So this is literally the idea that these vamps are representing our sisters, indigenous women, who are gone, and we're walking with them through this process. The intention behind this was to honor the lives of missing and murdered indigenous women of Canada and the United States, to acknowledge the grief and torment families of these women continue to suffer, and to raise awareness of this issue and create opportunity for broad-based dialogue in, on the issue. The idea for walking with our sisters and, and the person who really started us off on this path is a Métis artist named Christy Belfort. She is a really incredible artist and an amazing activist and very humble. She generally doesn't like to be in the center of all the attention. Um, but it's important to me to acknowledge that she was the, the catalyst here. And she talks about where the idea came from. There are two young women who went missing some years ago in Ontario. And every year, because they're still missing, their families organize around the time that they, they went missing to continue this push to find them. And so there was something, I believe she said she heard it on the radio talking about them, and she was thinking as a mother just how horrific this is to not know where your daughter is. And she is a mother of a daughter. So from a very compassionate place, imagining what this feels like, Later, with those thoughts in mind, perhaps, um, she had a dream. And in her dream, this came to her as a way to honor the missing and murdered women. Being aware that these two young women were only two of many. Thinking about it as a family member as well, putting herself in that position and trying to imagine what that felt like. One of the things that comes through very, very clearly is that any family and friends who experience this type of a loss, whether it's a loved one who's gone missing or has been murdered or both, is the grief that they feel that is for most of us unimaginable. But because of what this then sometimes involves them in, the process, if you have somebody who's been murdered and then you have to deal with court after that, if you have a person in your, in your life who has gone missing and is still missing, that's a daily torment. This is an ongoing grief that never fades, even when you have closure, so-called. But a lot of the time, there isn't quite the recognition, and for many years there wasn't recognition, that there were a lot of indigenous women and girls going missing and being murdered. And so publicly, there wasn't as much for the families to support them, or a lot of understanding that what they were dealing with is something very particular to that circumstance. Where do they go to get the support? There weren't very many supports in place, as we hear when we talk to those families. So part of walking with our sisters, part of the idea there is to create that space and hold that space where they can grieve, and they can celebrate and they can talk to other families, talk to people who are standing there with compassion, and hopefully through that, have the opportunity to grieve in a healing way. The third part is to raise awareness of this issue. 
So one of the things that I had done as well in, in trying to prepare is even though we have always, from the beginning, talked about walking with our sisters as something that is for the indigenous women of Canada and the United States. The reality is, these are very different contexts. Right now in Canada, we have a national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women. But with that, what I will say is when we first started walking with our sisters in 2012, there was no talk of an inquiry. <coughs> and in fact, in 2014, our then Prime Minister, when asked about missing and murdered women, apparently reportedly said, it's not an issue that's on his radar. So even though there was increasing awareness and calls for an inquiry to understand what is happening and what we can do about it, the government of the day said, it's not an issue that's important enough for them. So we're actually living in a very different world now where we have a national inquiry that has been started. What this looks like in the United States, as far as I can tell, it's not maybe on the radar for most places. What I have come across is suggestions that this isn't, and this is where we have started from as well, this isn't a phenomenon unique to Canada, not by any stretch of the imagination. But how much activity has been going on around it to raise the awareness, how effective it's been, let's say effective, even though that's not the best way maybe to frame it, but how much awareness across the board has actually been developed is different, and it's different not just from between Canada and the US, but also in different communities. So this is also another one of the things that we are trying to do through Walking With Our Sisters, is to help raise awareness. So as Walking With Our Sisters tours, it's building that awareness, hopefully, but also in activities like meeting here today. That's another thing that's part of what we consider our work, is to help share these stories and to help build this awareness and hopefully get some dialogue going. So the dialogue that I would hope for today, or at the very least some in, in some work to be done, which I know I started to do and, and, and it really made me aware of my own lack of knowledge truly about what this means in the US context, is for all of you hopefully to start thinking about that as well. What are the numbers here? Are there numbers here? Is this something that shows up in any way in, in public discourse? Those types of things, that's part of the ongoing work. So if nothing else, I would be very, very grateful to know that these questions have been raised and that you will leave here seeking answers to them. Missing and not forgotten. So when we talk about honoring, this is one of the things that is important, is that not forgotten that we're holding the memories very much close to us and celebrating them. And what I've shared on this slide is a quote from an article that I was reading. Uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia, there is a section of the city called the downtown east side. And this is an area that is maybe infamous for being one of the low income places and for many years, the women of the area in, in downtown Eastside, PTES, were regularly going missing. And there wasn't a lot of attention being paid to that. Part of the issue there was that a lot of the women were involved in the sex trade. And so when it came to this being raised with the police, for example, they never took that seriously. But the women themselves, eventually said, we know that we're, we're losing people. They're dying, they're being murdered, they're going missing, and we have no idea where they're going, and nobody is paying attention. They took it upon themselves to start organizing in their community. And so they actually started in 1991. One of, the, one of the things that they do, and this is this uh, presentation here today, something I'm very conscious of, is they have an annual march on February 14th, Valentine's Day. They've been doing this since 1991, like I mentioned. We very much consider ourselves as following in their footsteps. 
there's work that's been done preceding Walking with Our Sisters. And we acknowledge that and we respect that and deeply appreciate what they did. So one of the things that they had stated in one of the more recent marches um, in 2001, as quoted in this article, states, we are Aboriginal women, givers of life. We are mothers, sisters, daughters, aunties, and grandmothers. Not just prostitutes and drug addicts, not welfare chiefs. We stand on our mother earth and we demand respect. We are not there to be beaten, abused, murdered, ignored. <clears throat> For me, this is an incredibly powerful statement. So this is the part where I say, even though these are very difficult things to discuss, we don't need to focus solely on the negative aspects. In fact, I think we need to always be building as well on the positives without ignoring those realities. And when I read a statement like this, what I read is strength. What I read is resilience. Power. And these are women who are by and large considered powerless, hugely powerless in society. Not only the statement of themselves as people and not just prostitutes, not just drug addicts, as people, but also people with agency. And that was what inspired them to march and to continue organizing throughout the next. How many years has it been? Over 20 years. This image right beside it are a collection of maps that were made by women from the downtown side. So when Walking With Our Sisters was started, we were asking for donations from, from artists of maps, and they were being created in how many different places. And one of the incredible gifts was this collection that was made by those women. Because for them, this was an important project. And they wanted to support it. So when we, what we call, set up the installation, we call it the install, these are the ones that will always go down first. And they lead the path so that we always remember their leadership in the downtown east side. And we pay tribute to them through that. We also, I think, should take that moment, hopefully, to mark that in your memory. Because I know there's another, I don't know what to call it. It's the, the V-Day, I think they call it a movement. Events are, it's supposed to be marked on February 14th about uh, basically feminist movement. but. That day, actually identifying that day to honor and, and reflect on women, actually there was the earlier celebration that started in the downtown side in 1991. So I think that it becomes really important for us to, to know that that was happening, but to think about what that means when we don't really know that these things are happening. I know that choosing that date probably, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it wasn't done uninten like intentionally to obscure this, but one of the things that can happen and all too often does is activities and, and events like this that do become obscured when more mainstream attention is applied in a slightly different direction. So given that, that February 14th is tomorrow. I really wanted to acknowledge the downtown east side and the fact that they will be marching tomorrow as they have for so many years now. <coughs> so our project, and, and this is interesting, our own language echoes downtown east side because we recognize where we're also coming. So this is how we talk about the work that we do. We say that this project, Walking With Our Sisters, is about these women paying respect to their lives and existence on Earth. They're not forgotten. They are sisters, mothers, daughters, cousins, aunties, grandmothers, friends, and wives. They have been cared for, they have been loved, and they are missing. 
this phrasing actually did not come directly from the way that it was phrased on that one sign that I referenced in the last slide. But it echoes it. And I think it is so amazing when I realized that just how much we actually do owe to the work that has been done before us. So even though I think this is an incredible project and I'm very proud to be a part of it, I also think it's important that we always remember that this is not just our work that we we're doing. There's so many other people, people who came before us, and hopefully people who will come after us. And so we acknowledge that history of where we're coming from. So with the project itself, it was started in June of 2012. And the general call out was issued on Facebook by Christy for people to create mocks and talks. So these, this is what I refer to as the vamps. And so if you're not familiar with moccasins, they are basically our version of footwear. And in the style where I come from, there's different ways of constructing moccasins. Every, every nation, every tribe has their own style. But in, in our area, our part of the world, most commonly what we have is a piece that goes on the top of the foot that we refer to as an upper or a vamp. And so this is what Christy had envisioned with these vamps, these moccasins, moccasins and tops. And just went out in Facebook and people started to respond. They responded so incredibly. Initially, the number that was being asked for, or the hoped for number, actually, was 600. And the number 600 was significant because this was around the number that one of the groups in, in Canada, the Native Women's Association of Canada, had independently started investigating this issue. And was, so they started seeking out family members and friends to share information about their loved ones so we could begin to have an idea of how many women we were talking about. Through their own work, the number that they came to by the time that they published was 583, I believe it was. And so this call out went out actually a little bit after that number was released. So it was rounded to 600 because we knew for sure that there would have been more women who went missing and who had been murdered in the interim. I can tell you, and I remember this so clearly, when we were thinking about the thing, getting prepared for the very first installation, there were vamps that were coming in, but it was nowhere near 600. And so we kind of got a little nervous about that, thinking, okay, we're not going to get 600, but that's okay. Maybe we don't need that. Maybe it's just enough, and you know, we'll just we'll just scale things down. We'll adjust. It's 1600, but the number actually was 17. 1,723, I think, was the exact number. So that was considerably more than expected. And it was very overwhelming to see that kind of a response, how many people were connected, how many people wanted to send something to support this project. And the map, you see the pins on the map, actually are the locations that we were receiving the bounce from. So there were probably mostly coming from Canada, but as you see, there's quite a bit in the United States, but also from abroad. So Facebook was incredible for that, how far that reach was, but also a reflection of people themselves from across the world understanding this as an important issue and wanting to contribute, wanting to, to be involved in some way. So what I had mentioned earlier was that we, just, we, we spoke about it, and sometimes still do, as a memorial art exhibit or an installation, a commemorative installation. We're using language that kind of has that art base to it. And in some ways, that is how we, and I say we as in more of us, I don't think Christy ever had this in her head, but we understood it kind of that way. Very conventional art installation. We're going to install this project. We're going to travel around and go from galleries to museums. And this is really one of the starting points. But before we actually even went anywhere, our first installation, our first place that we hosted it, 
we have already shifted in our thinking tremendously and really began to understand that what we were talking about was a ceremony. So the facts themselves are pieces of art, absolutely. They're stunning and amazing, but they are not just that. And when they came together, they're not just a collection. This isn't just an art display. There is something else happening here. And for us, we understand this as a ceremony. We speak about all of the components of it as a bundle. And when the bundle is shared with the public, and that particular ceremony, piece of the ceremony is enacted, that's within the context of what we call as a lodge. Just like my introduction in Cree, this is also, although these terms are in English, obviously not Cree or any other indigenous language, but the concepts are indigenous. That was a piece as well about that reclamation, which is important, but also to signal for us that the work that we're doing is actually something more than simply mounting an art display. There is considerably more that's going on in there. And so what I wanted to say about ceremony in the bundle in the lodge is that these are really big concepts, actually. And there's certain knowledge that we hold as Indigenous peoples, and I can speak as a Cree person, that not everybody holds this knowledge. And just because you hold it doesn't mean you have a right to share it. So sometimes it can be really tricky to talk about certain things. Um, and also these are com complex concepts as well, which I'm pretty sure I wouldn't do justice to. But I did want to say a few things about ceremony. Um, I was at a lecture a couple of days ago, and one of my dear friends was speaking. And she spoke about ceremony. And what she said really struck me. Um, so Tracy Lindbergh basically said, ceremony isn't an event. It's a, a, it's a process of learning. What we do in ceremony, what we understand involved in our ceremonies, is that these are actually the places where knowledge is kept and transmitted, including laws. But in this process of doing this learning and in the ceremony, what I've come to understand and the way that I tend to speak about it is for me, ceremony is about connecting. This is one of the most fundamental and important aspects of ceremony for me, is that idea of connecting. So the connect, connection with each other, but also connection with however you conceive of this. And for me, as the creator, that this is my, my relationship that I'm enacting. But also because of where I come from and what we believe in, we don't believe that when people pass on, that they disappear completely. We still have our own relationships with them, and one of the ways that we maintain those relationships are through our ceremonies. So these are the things that are connected to this idea of ceremony for me. The bundle as well, we think about it maybe as a material collection. So we have the baths and other items. But there is actually more that goes on with that concept too. And one of the things that I just want to point to is, is this idea of a bundle having a certain, um, I want to say, agency of its own. There are things that happen around and with the bundle that are really quite incredible and you see the way that people are drawn to this. And I think one of the very starting points to, to begin to understand that is when we ended up with over 1,700 maps when we were thinking that we were only looking for 600. There was something going on there that was beyond any of us. And this is the way that we conceive of it. This is the way that I conceive of it more, more specifically. And inside of the lodge as well, the physical gathering place, that's part of what the lodge is. But there's also other concepts associated with this idea of a lodge. But one of the things that, in, in some of the images, when we get to them, you'll see this, is the way that the bounds are configured. The idea is that they're going to be on the floor. And so you will walk along beside them. But when you walk along inside of this lodge, when it's all set up, there is, sometimes it's eerie, actually, the feeling of presence. Each of the maps are intended to represent the life of a person. And you almost see the sense of them standing there. So inside of the lodge, we are gathering, but it's not just us 
human folk who are present in the physical here and now, there is that sense of our relatives also being there present with us. So this is why it is really important for us to continue to make sure that we're clear as much as possible that what we're talking about is a ceremony, it's not simply an art show. There is an aspect of that, I'm not dismissing that, but I really want to emphasize that there is something different that is happening with this project. And I actually haven't yet figured out a different word to use other than project. Um, English fails me as a language or something like this, because project just doesn't seem appropriate. But for lack of a better term, this is what I'm still calling it. So the unfinished mops and tops, as I mentioned, represent the unfinished lives of women, girls, and two-spirited people. And I just want to point to this as well, which is an aspect of the way that things shift. So when we first started, we really were thinking primarily of women. Women as a term that was maybe not defined precisely. But women who were identified, indigenous women, the concept, women, were going missing. Through this work, and as people have joined us along the way, we've come to understand that sometimes the term woman, and how it's signified, how it's defined, is very problematic. That you exclude people. More people will get lost in the use of that term. So right now, I am not defining it in any particular way. What we say is, well, who identifies women? It's up to them. We're not going to say it is something that is based on biological sex or anything like that. So we still use the term, but we have to point to the fact that it is not exclusive in that sense. Or at the very least, we're not defining those boundaries that may or may not exist. Girls as well. So in terms of youth, so when we're thinking about female person, who are going to be singing, we were initially thinking about talking about primarily adults. But we realized that a lot of our young women, our girls, are also going to sing just this issue includes them as well. And then the two-spirited people. And so two-spirited is a term that we use that other people, including indigenous people, might prefer another term, something inside of the spectrum of LGBTQ plus there. But two-spirited as a concept is specifically an indigenous one. Some people talk about two-spirited, really will talk about it as gay people, and it's not simply that. They'll talk about it as trans people, it's not simply that. Like the term woman, it is definitely not one that I'm gonna attempt to define. But for the folks who use that concept, it's really important that we acknowledge that, but also that we acknowledge that when we're doing the work that we're doing, we also include them. In the inquiry in Canada that's taking place, there's been some work to try and have men included. And there's a lot of discussion about whether that's appropriate or not, and why they would be excluded. If we hear, especially when we think about it, why, when we're trying to be inclusive. But what we feel is that there are very particular factors that affect women, girls, two-spirited people that don't exist for our men, even though our men, or indigenous men, are being murdered. They are disappearing at incredibly alarming rates. Their families are struggling just as much as the families of the women who have experienced this. We're not dismissing them, we're not failing to acknowledge that that is happening, but in this particular project and with this work, and this is apparently the position so far of the inquiry as well, that the focus does need to be in this way because there are distinct things happening that need to be addressed distinctly. So with the bundle, all of the elements that are associated with the overall project that I call, refer to as the bundle, the moms and tops are part of that. But there are also songs. So songs that were donated in very much the same way the vamps were, where a call went out, artists responded. They recorded songs, traditional songs, sent them into Christy, and they were incorporated in our bundle. So when the lodge is up, and we're gathered together, 
through this experience, you will be listening to these songs as well. It's a really important piece. There are also two eagle stops, which I will point out when we get to the pictures so you know what I'm talking about. But one of them was dedicated to and, and is used for those who remain missing and the other for those who were murdered. And what we invite family members and friends to do for their loved ones is to bring in a feather which will be added to the staff. An eagle feather is preferable. <coughs> the other, another element, and, and there are many more, and I just simply can't speak to everything, but these were the foundational ones, so I mentioned these, that are the medicines that we use. So for us, the medicines really are the plants that have certain gifts for us. One, tobacco is used for prayers. Sage, cedar, sweetgrass, there's different kinds of plants that are used for smudging, which is helping to cleanse an area, transform the space. We use this in the lodge so that people can smudge themselves, but we also lay the medicines down in the lodge so that there is protection there and care for the people who come in. These are some of the very important center or heart pieces of the bundle and our ceremony, but like I mentioned, that's not all of it. Another part that is really, for me, I was just my own personal feeling, that our bundle is really about the people too. The people are part of the bundle. And one of the powerful things about this project is how community-based it is. So it's entirely crowdsourced. Everything that, that comprises the bundle came from community folk who responded and donated. It costs money to get it from location to location and to host the ceremony. That is provided by people who are donating and through different actions that we're taking. So we're not looking for, nor will we accept, funding from the government. We also will not accept funding from uh, resource industry companies because they often have a very, they actually play in, in their activities like a, a really important role that's not often talked about or fully understood in this phenomenon. So we are definitely not looking for donations for big oil companies. Instead, we're relying on our community to help support this. So the posters here, this first one is uh, the option for action. This was for this, actually the second one that we held. And what this was was an online action that we did through Facebook entirely, where we asked artists and anybody to donate different things that we auctioned off online. And the very first one that we held we raised over $30,000. I think it was three weeks we ran the auction. And we split the proceeds with two other groups. And so the second one that we did in 2014 um, was actually the same idea. And it, it really did amazingly well. Another thing that we saw happening in the center picture are, this is tea. It's a berry tea that smells incredible. And one of the local companies in Edmonton, Mother Essentials, which is an indigenous owned company, they actually developed, they, this is one of their own tea blends that they already had, but what they did was they took that tea blend, they dedicated it to walking with our sisters, had this design, which is in the shape of a bath, which is just beautiful, and have donated the, the profits from this to walking with our sisters. And that was entirely something that they themselves chose to do. The third thing that I have up here is from one of the communities who hosted Walking With Our Sisters, they did their own fundraising. So we have fundraising that we do national level, so our collective, in order to support the overall tour. But each community also has expenses that happen there, and so they need to be able to actually cover those expenses. And so every community has to develop some kind of fundraising plan. And the only thing that we ask again is you're not looking for government funding, you're not looking for resource industry funding. Whatever else, be creative, it's up to you. And there's all kinds of activities that took place. So just, just by way of example, for Glenflon, 
one of the things that they did was they helped that coffee house and they did fundraising that way. So many other examples. And actually this t-shirt is another example. This came through the auction for action. One of the, the ladies who was involved on the online admin team thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get t-shirts also to sell? So they started up a Teespring campaign and we've been selling these for the past few years now. They're quite popular and really amazing way just at that grassroots level to begin fundraising. So there's all these incredible things, initiatives, examples that I really wish I had time to, to detail more of them because I think that's one of the most exciting parts of the work that's going on. But collectively, this is one of the things that, that this points to. So we're community-based, as I said, but what happens when we start organizing together collectively? The incredible work that's getting done, when you're a part of it and you begin to witness it, this is one of the things that constantly blows me away. And so when I was even preparing for this presentation, going back and revisiting, it's just astounding to me. And I know I probably, I, I do have my own biases, but I really think that this is remarkable, not just because that's my own personal opinion, I think when you, when you see what's going on, it's hard not to agree that there's just some incredible, incredible work that is going on. So the gifts that come in, there are gifts that come in, not just in terms of our fundraising, although that, so there are monetary donations that people make in order to help support this work, but also different gifts. And so the first picture, these are some of the medicines that I mentioned. So we have tobacco on that side. We have sage up at the top. The very top, those are actually uh, Velcro buttons, which initially we thought we needed to help secure the gaps on the floor, and we found out we didn't really need it. But we had to do a call up when we thought we needed them, and so people were sending us in packages of Velcro to help with this, and then sweet grass. In the center are the maps that this lady, Joanne Morris, made. This was a gift that she made to walking with our sisters, and we have many examples of, of incredible gifting like this. The second one, these are cedar banquet boxes. And these were, I'm going to say, probably the initial gift to the bundle. These came from Hi to Buy, which is on the west coast of Canada. And the artist who did the beadwork, Marnie Smith, was also a community organizer. So initially when Rocky with our sisters was getting started, Haida Gwai was going to be the first community it went to. But things didn't work out, and this is something that does happen. And as it ended up being, Edmonton was the first location, which is where I was, where I'm from, or where I live, I mean, and is where I actually did local organizing for Rocky with our sisters. So she did the beadwork and the, the bedwork box carving was done by her husband. And even though walking with our sisters didn't end up visiting Heidi Glock, she gave these, she gifted these to the bundle. So these were present with us right from the very beginning. But they were that, somebody conceiving of a gift. And we've seen that in essentially every location we've been, people feeling moved to bring different kinds of gifts. So sometimes those gifts, like I said, are monetary to help support the efforts, but sometimes they're physical expressions like this. And so it has been growing quite a bit, so our bundle is not simply the maps and the other items that I mentioned as being kind of our starting point. Also all the people who are involved along the way, but also items like this. So the maps themselves, I want to go through um, Again, we we'll go back to just the, what that idea is of the box and top, that upper. And so this first picture, this shape here, is kind of the general shape, like I said, from my neck of the woods anyways, how we construct boxins. We use an upper that's shaped like this. They're done in different ways in different locations, but there, this is a fairly consistent in the, in the northern and the woodlands area to use this shape or something very similar. But when the call out went out for maps, there were a lot of people who said, what are maps? I don't know what they are. So people who were responding were not just indigenous, they were coming as the map showed from all over the world. Also, where they were indigenous, and they might not understand this as a piece of a moxin, nonetheless had no idea how to make of it. 
do I do? I want to do this, but I don't know how to do this. So one of the members of, of the National Collective, um, he's, he's a poet and an artist, Frederick Schofield, he makes the most beautiful, incredible moccasins. And so what he very generously, generously put together is a template for people to follow, including instructions. So people who wanted to contribute but didn't know how to do this work were also given support in this way. And as the work started to be done, so before we had our first installation in 2013, throughout the 2012 to 2013 period, as people were working at home, they were learning in some places, learning for the very first time how to do this kind of work, which for many of us would have been something we would have known had not a lot of our practices been disrupted. So there is a resurgence that is taking place through this work. And one of the examples that I pull for you here is this young girl, 10-year-old Hunter McKenzie, who through this process started to learn how to make maps and do some beaver. And in her words, she was proud to be working for it. What we also saw are people coming together before the installation even took place in meeting groups. So again, the first picture at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta was a group that included some demonstration, again, for the people who didn't really know how to bead or how to put together vamps or really anything like that, but wanted to do this work. And then the second picture are some older ladies from the Nigaling First Nation in Ontario who came together and basically did like a beating club. And there were quite a few that popped up in a lot of different places. And so pictures were being shared throughout this process of people coming together and doing these kind of beating clubs, connecting with each other, but connecting with really a traditional art craft. So the maps themselves, there are actually, so 1723 is what I believe we had in July of 2013. Um, we have something that's over 1800 now. So it is growing, although officially we're not accepting more maps. But when family members want to bring in a pair dedicated to their loved one, we will not turn them away. So this is part of the reason why our number kind of keeps growing. So at different communities, we often find family who do come in and ask if they can contribute a pair of maps for their loved ones. But what I wanted to highlight is that there are, with over 1,800 maps, with the numbers of women and girls and two-spirited people that we don't even know for sure what that number is currently, being represented here, there are so many different stories. So the stories of the women that they represent, but also the stories of the people who created the maps themselves. So what I wanted to just go through with some of these images are examples of some of the maps. Obviously with 1800, I can't show them all. Um, but to just show that there are also, in addition to so many different stories, many different techniques and materials being used. So I think about this as a reflection of the diversity of people that we are. And so I really wanted to highlight this. So these first pair of maps, <coughs> excuse me, just in case you can't read it from the back, so clearly I'll read this out. It says, Poppies and Remembrance. Maps arrived today with an artist statement by Patricia, Patricia Ross. Quote, this project touched me as in Vancouver we have had a terrible occurrence of the missing women of the downtown east side as well as the ongoing occurrences in the northern area of the province with the highway of tears and the mystery of how these women disappeared. Poppies always feel so bright and fragile, and when you find them in a meadow, they are associated in my mind with John McRae's poem, which he wrote in World War I, which is famous in Canada. I don't know if it is here. Yeah, in Flanders Field. Um, I use silk threads and silk fabric and ultra suede backing. That was the statement from Patricia Ross. The second maps are from artist Janice Tulos. These moccasin maps are made to honor a native woman's daughter who never lived long enough to dance in her moccasins. May they help her walk her path in the spirit world. So these maps have buttons on them, and the, and the, the, the felt, I believe that's felt that they're on, 
this is a motif that shows up in a style of, of craft on the West Coast bucket blankets. And so to me, this is an example of something that really speaks of that particular location, but also the dedication to honor somebody who never lived long enough to dance in her long since. These two maps that I placed on this slide, one of them, the one on the side, says, this represents my state, Iowa. The wild rose and the goldfinch are our state symbols and are to let everyone know that Iowa is with walking with our sisters. The artist is Ingrid Thiebaud. The second pair, that is embroidery. And the, the artist who sent it in said, I just completed my contribution to Walking With Our Sisters project, which commemorates the murdered and missing Aboriginal women of Canada and the United States. These moccasin maps, embroidered with Palestinian motifs that relate to land and nature, express my support to and solidarity with our Aboriginal sisters in the world. Some more examples of different styles that also, like I said, they're speaking to all of our different nations, all of our different identities today, and all of the different locations. So just a few examples because there are more. Um, but the first one here, this style, is raised beadwork, which I, in my head, associate, maybe not quite accurately, with hair cloth. It's, you know, I understand it as a particular hair cloth style of beadwork. The second pair are actually on birch bark. They're done, so you might not be able to see the detail quite clearly. It's very faint on the birch bark, birch bark itself, but it's made by folding the birch bark and binding it. And so you impress a design into the birch bark. And those are made from birch bark and in that technique. The third one over there, Amy Malbus, the artist, it is beadwork. But also in the circles, in the detail on this slide, I apologize, isn't as clear, but it's moose hair tufting. So basically it's moose hair that's dyed and then attached in such a way that it kind of sticks up and then you shape it. So it is very much a raised and, and almost 3D effect that happens. So that's a combination of beadwork and moose hair tufting on high. This bottom one here, which I really wish the color on this was better, um, but this is actually paint, a painting. So small dams are not very big. These are not very big, but they're mixed uh, media, primarily acrylic, as far as they understand Don Marie's work. Um, so I labeled it as acrylic on paper. So it wasn't just fabric that was used or hide. There was also other materials being used, like I said. And this other final example here that I have it is a combination of felt, rip-rack, rip-rack, in, in case you don't know, is, is this, these strips along the outside that are weavy, um, seal skin, beading, and reindeer fur. And so the artist, Marguerite Marit, actually explains these as being inspired by marriage of Arctic cultures, so herself as a savvy person, married into um, the north, I believe, she might be from Alaska, Alaska, you pick, or her husband is you pick, and Eskimo. Um, and then in Canada, we refer to Eskimo people actually as Inuit. So those northern peoples is really what this was an expression of. <coughs> so as I mentioned about this being very community-based, we've seen through the maps themselves. So this is actually mislabeled, like my apologies. But I was still thinking about this community-based expression. So we've seen this first in the maps, and one of the things that I had mentioned were the eagle staffs. So the eagle staffs, we knew were going to be part of the bundle, essentially close to the beginning. But where they came from as well was from a dream. So a Anishinaabe knowledge holder had a dream one night about these eagle staffs that would represent the women who were missing and then the women who were murdered. And in that dream, a very particular way that they were to look. So there were two women who agreed to sew this for him so that he could bring this vision to life. And this was going to be incorporated as the eagle staffs in uh, the bundle. And so Kathleen Speed and her mom, Jeanette, are the ones who did the work here, and those are the ones who are shown 
in the image. So that community-based response is something that is, every step of the way, very, very evident. So the final thing that I want to run through, and I don't know how, how we are on time here, I feel like I've been talking forever. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I have been. <laughs> have like 15 minutes. Yeah, and we, we wanted to do some questions, so I'll try and speed through this. I just wanted to give you an overview of then when I talked about the lodge, what the lodge looks like. So as it's actually put together, what we call the install, that's that process where we actually set everything up. We're putting together our lodge. This is the way that we understand it. And what it looks like in every location that the ceremony is held is different. It's a reflection of the local people there, and also the space. So this is the very first one that took place in Edmonton. Like I said, um, that was one that I was involved with organizing as well. And the, the space that we had, which was on the University of Alberta campus, this, this building is called the TELUS building. And this part of it that we were able to use, the atrium, overall is actually shaped like a canoe. And that was actually part of how the building was designed, apparently. We didn't even know this. But what we noticed it once we started laying this in place, how very much it was a canoe shape, and how fitting that felt for the beginning of the journey of this bundle. So this was what, from a balcony, we were able to take a picture of kind of what it looked like in the very first ceremony. The second one was in Regina, Saskatchewan. And every step of the way, we're learning something. We are trying to make sure that we're doing our work in the best way possible. And initially, we didn't understand that, what, well, we had no idea that, the, that there would be so many maps that ended up as part of the bundle. So we didn't understand how much space it actually would be. And so Regina had already started doing their organizing. And the space that they were able to have for walking with their sisters for 600 maps seemed more than sufficient. When we ended up with over 1,700, adjustments needed to be made. And so what they did to try and accommodate this is they started placing them on wall. And so you had a small walkthrough. It was actually a very small room. Um, and this is actually quite stunning. And also when you think about it just like as an art exhibit, totally makes sense and it feels even appropriate in that, that way. But when you think about it as a lodge and as a ceremony and as women in the lodge, them being on the wall definitely doesn't work as well. So, so much respect to Regina for doing what they did, but we definitely know that from that point on, one of the things we had to insist when it came to communities who were asking for the bundle to visit them was that they had to have a minimum of X amount of square footage available to them. So this is why some communities um, ended up not being able to host the bundle. That's one of the reasons that that happens. But what we also learned from this process too, as we were moving forward, was how much more work is involved behind the scenes. So in Edmonton, really there were only three of us organizing. And then we had to, but because it was community-based, we always involved the community from, from the outset. But when it came to all the work that was being done, we were very naive, and we thought the three of us could manage it. Now, every community has to have a heck of a lot more people involved in the basic organizing, and then have even more volunteers available to help while the, the ceremony is taking place. So this also creates a, a, a lot of work and resource demand, and people really want to be able to bring it to their communities, but sometimes they can't because of those constraints. So we've learned a lot along the way. Perry Sound was the third one. And as you can see, this looks like a very small space with very few maps. It was bigger. There are more pictures, but I couldn't fit too many. So I just wanted to give a sense of what that looks like. And what you see on the wall here, those bells hanging are cedar. So again, that idea of the medicine. But the medicine that is used is going to be what that local community tends to use. So in my area, um, we actually use something that's a type of a fungus. On the plains, you see more often sweetgrass and sage. And then in other areas, woodland, where they have cedar. Cedar is the, the medicine that they tend to use. So that's also a reflection of what is available and important to the local indigenous people involved. So Winnipeg, 
um, the different configurations we see, and I'm going to kind of speed through these. Um, Sault Ste. Marie. <coughs> Sault Ste. Marie, I just also want to note that even though I mentioned that the work that we do is really to honor missing, murdered Indigenous women, girls, two spirited people, we also have a collection, I'm going to call it that, of smaller maps that we actually refer to as the baby maps. And they were made for children to acknowledge the children who died in residential schools, the children who never came home. And Sault Ste. Marie location was actually at a former residential school. And so in preparation for this one, another call was sent out so that we could also bring in maps to honor those children. And so we carry that as well in the bundle. They weren't introduced here though yet, but this was part of where that inspiration came from. So Flin Flon, which is in Manitoba, and um, I also wanted to include a map to show you where all these locations were, but that was a little bit beyond my skill. Um, Thunder Bay, one of the things that you start to see more clearly too as time goes on is how people in the communities have started to add in visual elements that reflect who they are that are important to them. This, I would say, was always present, but we started to see it emerge in different and creative ways here, and, and one of the first really great examples here is Thunder Bay. So in the center, they have a turtle. In Saskatoon, at Wanuskewin Park, they incorporated a teepee, just the poles in this case, and then on the floor, this design up at the front down here, this is a wild rose. So it is something that is considered important and connected to Métis identity in that area. Yellow knife. I included three pictures here because in this picture you see there's a ramp. There was another room, so it actually spread out over two rooms. And the very first room was this. And on this pedestal was placed an Inuit map of the which sits traditionally in the middle of the igloo and is the source of life for them, essentially. It's what keeps them warm, it's what they cooked on, and is so incredibly important. When our, when our installation is done, we take pictures, take pictures through the process and then at the end. But once the ceremony, the opening ceremony happens, no more pictures are allowed. So some of the images aren't the complete lodge, like I just don't have them to begin with. And that's also why you don't see the kulik actually sitting on that stand, because the kulik was placed in there on the seal skin in the opening ceremony. And then this motif on the floor, which is actually just in front of here, was a fish. So something, and you see different kinds of hides. And then on this center wrap where there are different representations of Inuit and uh, Dene culture, so this was something that really kind of got very detailed and unfortunately hard similar had many elements to it. Red Deer, which was also going through two different rooms, so behind that wall was another piece. Komox in BC, Ottawa in Ontario, and this is there's a you probably can't see it very well, but at the very up on top of the blue is a canoe. So different ideas being expressed locally about their identity. And Aquasasmi, Mohawk territory, this is how they identify it, so I am following their lead. Um, this turtle was something they created specifically to be brought into the ceremony. North Battleford, Brandon, Manitoba. This infinity sign is a, is a symbol that represents Métis people, so we, we see it show up in a few different locations. Mount Pleasant, Michigan. This was the only stop that we were able to so far make in the United States. Um, there was always the hope to, to tour a bit more extensively, but as I said, resource constraints and everything makes it a little bit trickier than we had hoped, so we are very happy to have made it at least once this side of the border. Halifax, which I forgot to change the picture. My apologies. So Halifax was the one that just took place this year. 
So we have upcoming ones that are on the schedule, but they are subject to change. The final one though, which I have put at the bottom in 2019, that will be happening in Batash in 2019. That is absolutely the last one that we will hold. And at Batash, that is the homeland and, and will be organized predominantly by our elder, Maria Campbell. So there are some really important principles I wanted to talk about that are related to our governance, but we have definitely run out of time. Um, so what I would really just like to do is kind of leave this on the screen for a second so that you can take that in, but to just acknowledge those four principles that are foundationally what we follow. It is humility. We follow certain protocols. We're always guided by love. And one of the key things is volunteerism. So we do the work that we do all as volunteers. And then I also wanted to share with, my, with you my personal lessons from this whole process, which have been a lot, and I have never fully articulated them. But what I just wanted to end with, because I don't have time now to go through those, again, my apologies, these are actually the maps that I made. Um, so that was my starting point, actually, in becoming involved with working with, with our sisters was as an artist. And it was me sitting at home, feeling overwhelmed and feeling like I needed to contribute somehow to do better than I had been. I was actually sick, which was why I was sitting at home. And so I was feeling very helpless and powerless because of that. And when I saw this call on Facebook, I knew that maybe I couldn't do much, maybe I didn't have very much money, but I had beads, I had material, and I also had a certain skill. This is something that I consider a gift, and I connect it very much to my grandmothers and practice of healing. And so I dedicated these vamps to that idea that they would bring healing to families, not to any particular people, but just to families in general who were grieving these losses. In Edmonton, we, I was approached by um, some ladies from my community, and they asked, how can they buy some gowns to put them into the walking with their sisters? And I said, you, you can't really, like, these are not for sale, that kind of thing. But I said, I made a pair. So if you want to use those, if you want them for your family members, I'm happy to give them to you. So we actually dedicated them in the lodge to their mother, who was murdered, and to their sister, who was also murdered. So now these maps actually carry the memories of those two women who are, who are also my kin. So one of the things that came through there, I mean, hugely, has been the gift, which I wasn't thinking about getting anything in return ever, but just this gift of knowing that that idea of bringing healing, to a certain extent, there was a connection there with people from my own community, my, my extended family, my kin, but also from that starting place of feeling very powerless inside my home to knowing that something that I have done was positive and helpful to also then finding myself involved with walking with our sisters as a member of the National Collective and then traveling to different places and meeting so many people. I talked about it or thought about this initially as my personal lesson, but as, as I'm talking to you now, I want to say those are really the things I want to reflect on and leave you with as the final thoughts is what the gifts are. The gifts in approaching a very painful and difficult still issue, but remembering there are people involved and approaching them with love and respect and honoring. Thank you.